Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining today's Health Activist virtual meeting with Dr. Neil Shaw, who I believe is on the call now. Um, this is our second virtual meeting of our series, and the first one was last month with Dr. Vinny Aurora from the University of Chicago Medicine. If you missed that, you can find the recording of it on our website at www.healthactivistnetwork.org under past events or also on our YouTube channel, which you can find the links to uh, from our website. Just a few housekeeping reminders before we get started. This is intended to be an interactive conversation, and we welcome all comments and questions during the hour. We'd also like to see who we're talking to, so if possible, um, please turn on your webcams. Um, but it is, I'd also like to remind you to mute your phones when you don't have questions or comments so we can cut down on some of the background sounds. But don't forget to unmute yourself when you do have a, something to say. Um, lastly, this virtual meeting is being recorded and will be posted to the Health Activist Network YouTube channel and the website sometime next week. Uh, we'll be sure to notify you when it is live. Um, and now, uh, today we have Dr. Neil Shaw with us from the Harvard Medical School. He is our featured health reform advisor for the month of July. So please, if you haven't had a chance, check out his spotlight interview um, on our website. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Neil Shaw. Neil is an assistant professor of obstetrics, obstetric, sorry, <laughs> gynecology and reproductive biology at Harvard Medical School and director of the Delivery Decisions Initiative at Harvard, uh, Harvard's Adrian Lab. As an OBGYN in Boston, Dr. Shaw cares for patients during critical life moments that range from surgery to primary care to childbirth. As a scientist and social entrepreneur, he is a globally recognized ex expert in designing, testing, and spreading solutions that improve healthcare. Dr. Shaw is listed among the 40 smartest people in healthcare by the Becker's Hospital and has been profiled by the New York Times, CNN, and other outlets. He is a senior author of the book, Understanding Value-Based Healthcare. Prior to joining the Harvard faculty, Dr. Shaw founded Cost of Care, a global NGO that curates insights from clinicians to help delivery systems provide better care. In 2017, Dr. Shaw co-founded the March for Moms Association, a coalition of 20 leading organizations to increase public and private investment in the well-being of mothers. So, Dr. Shaw, thank you for being with us today. Uh, thank you so much for having me, and uh, I'm sorry that I can't get my webcam to work. It's going to be kind of a boring YouTube video, but we'll try to make it live. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so I just wanted to start today by asking you to tell us a little bit about how, what your career journey was and how you got into activism, and hopefully we can build on from there. Okay, that sounds great. Um, I think, you know, activism would be one of those traits that skips a generation because my grandparents, uh, they grew up during the Indian independence movement. They were very civically engaged and were um, revolutionary. <laughs> my parents, on the other hand, are very straight-laced immigrants. My mom's a dentist. My dad's an engineer. Um, and then, you know, I did the most predictable thing that uh, an Indian kid can do and went to medical school. Um, but it, it, might, it might be sort of like a delayed onset gene because, um, you know, I think I was telling Ashley earlier, and it was in the spotlight interview, that I, I didn't go to medical school with a soapbox or anything like that, but uh, my third year of medical school was really eye-opening for me uh, because, you know, um, basically, you know, at that point in your career, you're in 25th grade, you've spent a quarter century in a classroom, and you finally get to be deployed into the healthcare system and see how things actually work. And on one hand, uh, there's a lot that you see that's really inspiring because you see the full extent of our capabilities in medicine, but... Um, you know, I think everyone who's sort of introduced to what healthcare delivery looks like at the front lines comes away a little bit disillusioned, too, because you see all of our fallibility at the same time. And uh, one of the things that really struck me as a third-year medical student was that when people get hurt in medicine, they get hurt in two ways. They get hurt when we do too little and when we do too much. And it seemed to me that there were a lot of people thinking about how we address the problem of too little 
uh, but there were very few people thinking about how we make patients better off by uh, making sure that we do, do, don't do more than we should. And uh, that's sort of been the anchoring idea that's driven the last decade or so of my career. Great. Um, I know we had talked about, uh, right, could you expand a little bit on um, your third year of medical school like you, you touched upon? Um, and I think this is sort of going into your motivations for starting cost of care. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it was basically the fact that so I was in Providence, Rhode Island. I don't know if you guys have been, uh, but it is a it's a it's a lovely city, um, but it's a very impoverished city. And generally speaking, the people who come to see medical students and faculty for care are not the ones with the deepest pockets. Uh, so you know, I just noticed that um, you know we were making all of these decisions on behalf of these patients without really considering how it impacted what they would have to pay. And that seemed important to me. And it uh, was particularly striking to me because as a third year student, everybody around you feels omniscient. Like even the fourth year students seem to know everything. And uh, the one thing that literally nobody had any insight into was uh, what anything cost. And it seemed uh, kind of crazy to me. Um, so that's really, um, you know, I couldn't let go of that idea. And uh, I ended up uh, leaving medical school for a couple of years to try and fill in what I thought was a missing part of my education. Um, you know, I, I thought that what I needed to do is learn more about health economics, and so I spent a lot of time with economists, and I realized uh, in hanging out with them that they were missing something too, uh, which is primarily the fact that nobody goes to medical school to treat the GDP. Um, and so one of the sort of key insights for me was um, that I could add value in a room of economists by sort of tethering them to the ground. Um, and I could add value in a room of clinicians by helping them understand what the larger implications were of our decisions. Right. So I know you said uh, you started, you left med school for a while to start cost of care. And for someone who is listening to this, um, you know, when you enter the medical field after medical school, you still are sort of on the lower end of the totem pole. So what recommendations do you have or advice do you have for people who uh, are in the position that you were, who are trying to get people to listen to them, um, to, to make change really happen? Well, I mean, um, the, the truth is a lot of, I think, my experiences were not as intentional as they seem in retrospect sometimes, but I think the things that, uh, looking back that were helpful is that I, I had an anchoring idea, which was, you know, I, I, or more than an anchoring idea, I had a true north, which was that it just seemed wrong that, uh, you know, as an intern, like a brand new doctor, I could uh, spend tens of thousands of dollars just by clicking my mouse a few times without, you know, really any accountability from anybody. Uh, and meanwhile, the patients directly in front of me were struggling with these decisions. And I had some insight that not all these decisions had to be made that way, and that in fact, if we considered costs as part of it, we could lead, you know, get to a better outcome for the patient that was more affordable. So I guess just you know, having that true north, being totally crystal clear about um, you know, the, some line in the sand that you think that um, you, know, you want to rectify. And then um, I think the other thing that was really helpful is um, and I think Vinnie Aurora touched on this in, in the last uh, one of these meetings, this idea of sort of leading from where you stand. Just, you know, as a trainee, uh, I could not speak credibly from decades of experience of treating patients, but the one thing I could do is explain what it was like to be a trainee. And I was like, you know, I'm a brand new doctor at the best institutions in the country, and nobody's teaching me any of this, what gives. And nobody could really argue with that. That's a great point. Um, at this point, Right now, I'd like to open up the floor to anyone else on uh, the WebEx call right now who might have a question. Um. Um, Neil, hi, it's Karen Feinstein. Um, talk to us about why you became an obstetrician gynecologist. Hi, Karen, it's great to see you. I'm sorry you can't see me. Um. <laughs> but the baby's adorable. <laughs> yeah, oh, thank you so much. Yeah, um, I, I'm a new dad, too, so I uh, might have the most annoying uh, social media feeds. Um, <laughs> uh, so I became an OB-GYN by accident. Um, 
not not entirely back then, that's not fair, but definitely what wasn't what I thought I was going to do. I did OBGYN as my first rotation uh, to get it over with because it was the thing that I thought so clearly I wasn't going to do. And then I just had the hardest time figuring out what kind of doctor I wanted to be. I went through every rotation. I liked everything. Uh, and in the end, for me, uh, OBGYN felt like a way of not choosing because you kind of get to do everything. The only thing I had to give up was treating men, which I honestly miss. But other than that, I got to do primary care. I got to do surgery. I got to deliver babies. Um, so I felt like I was sort of doing the breadth of, of healthcare. And then I think I was just sort of naturally attracted to the kinds of people who go into women's health because um, you can't take care of women and care about women's health without being at least somewhat tuned into the deep social justice issues that uh, run in parallel with those things. And um, I think I just sort of liked those kinds of people. And uh, the more time I spent steeped in, um, you know, caring for women and uh, thinking about childbirth, the more I saw opportunities to try to make things better. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, hi, Dr. Shaw. My name is Danielle. I actually had a question for you about the Teaching Value Project. If you could um, touch a little more on how you get younger physicians to steer away from practicing in defensive medicine and actually looking at cost more. Sure. I mean, I think um, most medical students and residents in 2017, I think, see the writing on, on the wall in terms of all of these radical transformations that are happening in healthcare, and you know, even taking the current um, policy debate out of it. I mean, even preceding the election and uh, the sort of revisiting of the Affordable Care Act, I think that there was a sense that um, you know we were covering more people, but you know, still, uh, this is the least affordable healthcare has been in the last half century, and. Um, it's getting worse, and it's actually palpably different year after year as uh, someone who's caring for patients, uh, particularly someone who's usually caring for the most disenfranchised patients as a trainee. So people get it. I think what's hard is that um, it's not just the lack of education and the fact that we're not taught very much about cost. Um, I would argue, actually, that's not even that important. I think the more important thing is that the clinical environment around us doesn't really support um, being judicious or, or thoughtful. In fact, uh, you're often rewarded for doing more and not less, right? Like, you know, um, basically doing more things is equated with being thorough. Um, every case conference in the hospital is about things that are exceedingly rare. And so, you know, you often get, you know, rewarded for finding things that are really rare. So you chase things um, that, that are rare. When you're being uh, criticized for making um, or for, for bad outcomes, you're usually being criticized for the things that you didn't do but could have done, and you're never being criticized for the things that you did do but didn't have to do. Uh, so I think all of those things uh, contribute, um, but you know the um, the thing that is not lacking, I think, is will. I think that uh, particularly among that generation of clinicians, there's a tremendous amount of will for change, um, and what was lacking was guidance, which is where that teaching value project came from. Great. So my name is Kate, and I'm, I'm really moved by your passion for women's health. And um, I, in reading about you prior to this, I, I heard about your uh, advocacy efforts in March for Moms. I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about that and, and what you kind of see in that movement and the benefit of building a movement like that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, thank you for asking about that. So, um, you know, the, the stepped back Thing that I've realized uh, from being an obstetrician and for thinking, thinking about healthcare costs for a while. And this surprised me, even as somebody who's like really embedded in uh, obstetrics. It turns out that of our $17 trillion GDP, we spend 0.6% of it just on hospitalization for childbirth. Childbirth is the most common reason for hospitalization in the country. Um, and for all of that money, uh, one in three moms gets major surgery to give birth, and one in 10 babies goes to the NICU. And that's crazy. We can absolutely do better than that. And that just is the tip of the iceberg. It turns out we have the highest rate of maternal death in childbirth in the entire developed world, the lowest birth weights, the widest disparities, the worst access, and then we throw salt in the wound with the worst family leave policies. It's an abomination. And in fact, 
there's a the level of crisis in my mind is no different than the opioid epidemic. The difference is that the opioid epidemic, uh, there were more middle-aged white men dying year after year. Uh, so that led to something called the Fed Up Rally, uh, which um, you know sort of catapulted the issue uh, into the public discourse. And it's you know everybody on Capitol Hill knows about it. Everybody in the heartland knows about it. Um, uh, with maternal uh, health, you know there are more moms dying in childbirth today than there were 20 years ago. In fact, maternal death has been going up for 20 years with a trend line. So it's like a very similar thing, but it isn't that visible. So. Um, yeah, I just, I don't know, I was, I, I, I felt like we could be doing more. And I, I felt compared to other issues uh, like cancer, for example, the childbirth uh, community, if I'm being honest, was just less organized. Um, like we didn't really have a, a broad tent coalition that brought all the different actors together. Um, and so we didn't have a, you know, basically we came up with this uh, skeleton uh, platform for the March for Moms that included some of the issues I just highlighted. Um, we created a canvas for it, which is that we secured a national park permit to use the Jefferson Memorial on Mother's Day. And then we went around to every leading organization in maternal health and we told, we asked them, we sort of co-created it with them. And we said, if you had the Jefferson Memorial on Mother's Day, uh, what would you do with it? Um, and then they would come up with an idea and then we would ask uh, for some funding to help support it. Um, and that, that became the March for Moms. We ended up drawing uh, about a thousand um, moms on Mother's Day on the Hill. Uh, just the week after, um, you know, the, the House version of um, uh, what was the AHCA at the time and um, pointed out that, uh, you know, uh, motherhood shouldn't be a pre-existing condition with a thousand moms on Mother's Day, um, for yeah. example. Um, so we're, we're planning on doing this year after year and we're already sort of planning for 2018. What month, so during Mother's Day, are you planning any other events or is it uh, you're just gonna do it around Mother's Day? Well, I think so the, the, in the first iteration, we, we thought we would use the optics of, uh, you know, being at the cradle of justice on Mother's Day. But one of the things that we realized is that uh, moms are busy being moms and they usually have plans on Mother's Day. So we um, <laughs> dig in, get a little more creative, and I think you know we, we're still working on the national park permit, but we're hoping to get an even more visible spot like the monument, um, and do it the weekend before Mother's Day, so there's more availability for moms. And then we're just going to declare the entire week Maternal Health Week because that doesn't exist yet, so we're just going to make it up uh, and then sort of see where it goes from there. That's awesome. And Neil, this is Robert Ferguson, and I thought one of the things that struck me about your Spotlight interview was how you think through a complex issues, and you talked about this analogy with throwing spaghetti against a wall. Could you talk a bit more about what you mean by that and how you yourself all that thinks through issues and how to uh, target your uh, work on complex and a, and a wicked problems. Uh, sure, Robert. Um, I, I think uh, one of the things that I have learned um, is that there are multiple models of innovation and no one model is more legitimate than the other. So, you know, in, in pharma, um, they often use like a substrate model where they're trying to sort of fit two puzzle pieces together. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes, I, at least in my own career, I, I often struggle uh, in finding the balance between, you know, when to find out more information and when to act. Uh, and one of the things that I've learned is that there's also the spaghetti against the wall model of innovation, which is just try something, throw it against the wall and see what sticks. And then usually something will stick and then just sort of build from there. Um, and uh, I've kind of adopted a preference for that model and it's worked out okay. Um, you know, and, and particularly with, with complex problems, um, you know, often the process is just to take all of the different components of the complexity that you can think of uh, and just get them out on the table rather than, um, you know, sort of being paralyzed by the complexity. Just 
try to lay it out the best you can. And then once you do, much like putting a puzzle together, then you can start to figure out what the patterns are and uh, you know where to go next. Um, hi, um, my name is Tara, and um, I actually just hopped on, so I'm not sure what you talked about earlier, but I am particularly interested in, um, you know, studying value-based payments, so with respect to its uh, effect on education, like medical education in particular, um, and I have been following your, um, uh, uh, the learning network modules and, you know, looking at your webinars and stuff. Um, so, uh, do you, you know, do you want to, uh, first of all, do you want to shed some light to, you know, share your perspective on that? I'm a current medical student and an intern at GHF, so I would really like to know what I could do to understand this as a medical student, you know, to propagate this from where I stand, you know, bring it to my colleagues and, you know, go from there or to our you know, curriculum coordinator. I was really impressed with your SOAP V webinar and, uh, you know, just wanted your input on that. Um, sh sure. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I started off uh, in working in this area thinking about everything through the lens of education because when I started, I was a medical student, as I told you guys, and then, you know, Cost of Care launched a month before my intern year. <laughs> A residency, um, which is a whole other thing. But um, you know, so most of my time that I was thinking about uh, the role of uh, value in healthcare delivery, I was a trainee myself, and so um, you know that that's just sort of how I uh, approached everything. And it, it, we we did a couple of different things that you mentioned. You know, we wrote a textbook for McGraw Hill on value-based care for uh, clinicians, and you have this learning network where we highlight different tactics, uh, you know, like the SOAP V note, which is like a progress note for an inpatient that includes a value assessment uh, as part of uh, just what you do. Um, but I, I think, um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the distilled piece of wisdom is, is here, because I, I actually uh, don't think that my textbook is the answer, right? Like, I don't, I don't think that uh, reading a textbook or even getting any specific knowledge is the most helpful thing. I think um, really uh, the gap that I see when it comes to uh, being the, uh, someone who provides care and also uh, cares about uh, improving the way that we deliver care, meaning uh, making it more affordable and a better experience and safer, uh, is not lack of knowledge. It's lack of execution on the knowledge that we already have. Um, I think you know medical students and residents and trainees and just young people working in any part of healthcare delivery uh, usually end up being the experts in health system failure because usually you're the lowest on the totem pole and it's your job to fix it when things don't work. Uh, and so, in fact, I think that's a, a lot of what makes uh, trainees sometimes uh, cynical about healthcare. But I think probably the best piece of advice I can give you is uh, to. Uh, um, use the fact that you're the lowest on the totem pole and have such a great understanding of what doesn't work um, to, um, you know, uh, think constructively about, um, you know, the systems that you're working in. The, the, the challenge of systems is, is that they're invisible um, uh, to most people, but they tend to be the least invisible to trainees because, you know, all, all, of, all of the dysfunction falls on your shoulders. Uh, okay, so that's about uh, the philosophy change, and I uh, really appreciate your, your input on that. In terms of actions, what I meant to say, so for example, I am from Arizona, so do you have, you know, based on your already pilot projects, do you, like, can you connect us to some local champion whom you know or, you know, whom the students can approach and then bring back the idea to their uh, education coordinators and stuff to include that in our curriculum because uh, the school that I go to is really open to such ideas from students and you know I so in terms of those actions do you have any such links that you can set us up with? Uh, yeah absolutely and uh, you know good for you it's wonderful that you're in an environment where uh, 
um, your educators are receptive and there's a lot that you can start to pull off the shelf. It sounds like you're already plugged into our learning network, which has a number of, of tools available. Um, there are, um, in addition to the uh, video modules at Cost of Care, uh, the Dell Medical School actually just released a number of free publicly available um, uh, web-based interactive modules for people who are interested in value um, that they hope will be used by people around the country. Um, uh, there are a number of schools that are starting to use our textbook as, as part of courses. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I would I would encourage you to, you know, reach out to um, your medical school and, and see what you can do. And uh, you don't have to reinvent the wheel necessarily. There's definitely a lot that you can grab uh, from the Cost of Care website and from other resources. Okay. Thank you. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hey, this is Jill Arnold. How are you, Neil? Hey, How's Jill. <laughs> oh, my gosh. How's it going? Great. Um, I have a question for you. So yeah. you've done, um, obviously, you know, you went into um, delivery decisions, a series of uh, projects and uh, written a bunch of papers. You went in with a bunch of hypotheses. What has surprised you most? I sound like I'm asking you to create, like, a clickbait headline, but, like, what, <laughs> what surprised you? Like, what are your top three surprises, things you didn't expect to find out? in your journey there? Oh my gosh. Well, first of all, um, Jill, um, it, it's delightful to uh, hear you on this webinar and you should probably be a featured activist on this network. Um, what? Thank uh, you. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know. I mean, so so just, just by background, so Jill Arnold uh, started a website uh, called The Unnecessarian and started one called CesarianRates.com, which is one of the first things on the internet that started to make C-section rates of hospitals publicly available, uh, and then went on to actually work with uh, Consumer Reports and other organizations that are, that are now doing this uh, more routinely at, at, at large scale. Um, and when I started to get interested in C-sections, um, her website was the first one I found, and she was one of the first people I, I reached out to. Um, everything about this journey has been surprising. So, I mean, uh, I, I've keyed in on C-sections for a lot of different reasons, both because I I personally just, I do them and I, they, you know, I, I've got a lot of thoughts about about it on a, on a personal level, but also because it's the perfect model for uh, overuse. It's the most, so C-section is the most common surgery performed on human beings anywhere in the world. There's also the most common surgery performed on Americans. Half of them are unnecessary. And at the hospital level, they vary from seven to 70%, which means your biggest risk factor for the most common surgery is not your personal preferences, not your medical risk, but which hospital you go to. And so, the last three years of my life, actually, most of my brain has been devoted to figuring out what it is about the hospital that makes the hospital an independent risk factor and then what we can do about it. Um, and uh, I guess, you know, it's been like peeling back the layers of an onion, Jill, but like, for example, like when we look at the fact that the C-section rate in this country has gone up by 500% in just the last generation or two of moms, uh, every conventional explanation for why that's happening <laughs> doesn't bear any fruit. Um, it turns out it's not because moms are different demographically than they used to be. They are. Uh, moms are older, there's more obesity, but it turns out C-section rates have gone up in 18-year-olds just as fast as they've gone up in 35-year-olds. It's not well explained by medical malpractice. It's not well explained by reimbursement policy. Um, so, you know, uh, I don't really know. I mean, I, I think the, you know, actually, I think probably what it comes down to is both for, um, I think the biggest insight that I've had, I don't know about surprising, but it is surprising. It's, it's just so obvious. But um, the biggest insight I've had lately is just this idea that uh, when the, the plurality, if not the majority of errors in healthcare are not because of lack of knowledge and they're also not intentional. Um, and that's, for me, that's really profound because if the problem is lack of knowledge, you educate people. And if the problem is that, um, people know what to do, but they're messing up intentionally, and then you fix incentives, like you change payment, you change malpractice. Um, but with C-sections, I've come to believe for C-sections and many other things that we know what to do, but we're messing up unintentionally. And that suggests an entirely different type of solution that I don't see really anybody working on. Like the idea that we could be do, doing C-sections uh, erroneously and not on purpose uh, is just not a, 
a formulation of the problem that I'd heard before. And uh, I'm really excited about the idea of pushing on that and seeing where it takes us. That's awesome. Thanks for your answer. Neil, can you talk to us a little bit about why other countries get better maternal outcomes in pregnancy and why we have such high rates of mortality and what we could do about it? Um, yes. Um, so the reason that other countries do better in maternal health and I think also uh, why they do better in many other metrics from just all cause mortality to uh, anything else um, is that uh, like if you want to feel patriotic about the US healthcare system, the thing that we do better than anybody else is take care of things that are rare uh, and take care of uh, people who are um, critically ill. Like nobody comes close to us. I have a very close friend uh, who um, was American working in the UK and uh, um, his wife had um, twins but had a rare type of twins where the two babies were sharing the same placenta and that's not great because one baby can end up stealing all the nutrients, uh, the umbilical cords can get tangled, lots of bad things can happen. This is like a very, very high risk pregnancy and uh, the way that her care was managed was very different from the way her care would have been managed in the US uh, where we would have done lots of ultrasounds, but she's the kind of patient where you would want to do a lot of ultrasounds and you'd want to have a lot of specialists involved and you'd want her to be at a tertiary academic medical center. And um, I guess the way I think about it is that our system is optimized for the exceptional patient and, you know, the Western European countries are optimized for the average patient. And so on average, their outcomes are better. Um, you know, and it, it's underneath uh, all of this, I think, is sort of like a normative kind of, um, judgment or, you know, something about just who we are as Americans. Uh, and one of the things that we have to confront in trying to make things better is uh, the fact that right now with maternal health, for example, we are hurting the healthy majority of moms in the interest of making the sickest minority of moms safer, um, which is uncomfortable to say, but true. Um, Dr. Shaw, I was uh, wondering if you could speak more about um, our tendency and our rates of um, higher C-sections. I was wondering if you think it's due to women's perceptions of childbirth um, and maybe uh, media influences or our current state of midwifery and how that could be an underutilized field. What do you think are the driving forces? There's no silver bullet here. You know, there are countries that have midwives as the first line of care, and they have lower C-section rates than we do, but their C-section rates are still going up and they're still way higher than they should be. Um, you know, the maternal demand story, the fact that moms want it is one of the ones that uh, is propagated frequently in the media, but is just not true. Like my favorite headline is a UK Daily Mirror story that says too posh to push and it's a picture of Victoria Beckham. Um, you know, it, it turns out less than half a percent of moms electively request C-sections the first time around. Um, and then even beyond that, uh, there are all these, you know, questions around agency and childbirth that, you know, I, I sort of wrestle with. So, I mean, the, the drivers uh, are multifactorial and complex, but I think that the biggest modifiable driver is actually this idea that um, the environment that moms are being delivered in right now is extraordinarily complex. Uh, and complex environments were, are places where lots of errors can be made. Um, the way I think about it, you know, science has made every other aspect of our lives simpler, from the way we get around to the way we put food on the table to the way we communicate. But in healthcare, new scientific capabilities always make our lives more complicated. It creates more decisions, more choices, more opportunities to mess up. And, you know, childbirth has evolved to a point where 99% of American moms are born in environments that function like ICUs and they're surrounded by surgeons. That's why we do too many too many surgeries. I had a question branching off of that. Um, so you kind of alluded to like an over medicalization of uh, maternal care, especially in OBGYN and how we are trying to prevent the more 
difficult cases of them having complications. And I was trying to connect back to the cost of care discussion we had earlier and how I, I'm more concerned with how that's a barrier for a patient and empowering them to make health choices if they don't know what they're going to be charged and aren't informed about their insurance options and then the doctor does not know that information either. And it's, uh, they can't answer their questions about, well, what will be the cost for these different health uh, choices that I make as a patient? Uh, so I'm wondering how, what we can do for doctors to be more informed, if that's through experience that they find out um, what's typically more expensive for patients based on uh, health insurance or what can be done about that without, you say it's not due to lack of education, but what, what is the barrier then for them to be able to share that information? Um, I think in the case of specific prices, it is lack of knowledge to a degree. Um, like if you're ordering off a menu that doesn't have any prices on it, it's really easy to get the filet mignon every time, and there are no prices on the menu right now. Um, but there are like, it, I guess the way I think about it, uh, so this is the least affordable that healthcare has ever been for the average American right now. Um, uh, at least it's the, the least affordable things have been for the last half century. And there are three failures of the point of care to me. One is that we don't tell people what things cost in a consistent way, and that's true, that's what you're pointing out. But in addition to that, we also don't point out what things are worth it. Like a third of the things that we recommend, we don't need to be offering. Uh, and then sometimes things are both expensive and worth it, and we fail to recommend uh, legitimate options that are available to make things more affordable for people. Um, so. I think all those failures together are contributing to the problem, and all of them need to be addressed. I'll tell you one more thing about this that, that, that I've been pondering lately is, because the, the, uh, I've watched this cottage industry around healthcare transparency grow up uh, over the last, uh, you know, decade or so from, actually it went from being a cottage industry to, uh, you know, $50 billion in the Silicon Valley to make the Yelp for healthcare, whatever. And uh, one of the things that has struck me recently is that uh, the internet pretty much replaced travel agents, you know, um, but it has not replaced real estate agents. And thinking about why has been instructive to me about healthcare because, you know, um, the reason why you, I mean, Zillow exists, but you still need a real estate agent. Uh, uh, and actually, the connection is that the, the person who uh, built Zillow is currently working on a healthcare startup called Amino um, that you guys may have uh, seen or, or heard of um, that's trying to make uh, healthcare prices more transparent. But, you know, if you're trying to buy a house, two different houses, um, you know, one place can have a better kitchen, the other place is a better, I don't know, living room. And it's really hard to trade off the value of those two things and, and to, to know that you're pay, paying a fair price without having an agent who transacts in that marketplace all the time and can tell you if you're, if you're paying a fair amount. Um, and, you know, healthcare is very similar. There is these huge information asymmetries. You sort of need someone transacting all the time to let you know whether or not, um, you know, the echocardiogram is worth it uh, uh, for, for the cost. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I kind of feel like healthcare is going to be one of those places where you always need an agent. Um, and the person who's best positioned to be that agent is probably the doc or the midwife or the nurse. Hi, and Dr. Shaw. My name is Emily. Sorry, Robert. Um, <laughs> so what role do consumers then play in this grand scheme of things in um, order to like reduce costs and stuff. Um, obviously, not every consumer is really empowered and knows a lot about their care. But for those that do, is there like a point where they say no to tests, that sort of thing, to reduce costs? I think it just it well, in general, I I hesitate to paint uh, patients or consumers with a broad brush. Um, I think part of the challenge is that uh, like you know. You can look up the cost of an echocardiogram on Google right now, but nobody shops for an echocardiogram, you know, because that's just not how healthcare is delivered. Like you walk in with chest pain, and then, you know, you have a conversation, and then that sort of leads to maybe needing one. But um, I think uh, there is definitely a role to come at this from both directions. I think clinicians need to be better agents, and I think patients could do more to uh, try to be as informed as possible, but also uh, hopefully feel empowered to. Um, 
you know, just engage with their clinicians and have conversations about cost. I think actually for cost of care, the next frontier is to think about this cost conversation um, in more depth because, you know, the, the difficult conversation in medicine is actually the ultimate artisanal craft. It happens behind closed doors. Um, we have very little insight into exactly how it takes place. And we know, though, that some people are great at those conversations and some people are terrible. Uh, and there's a big opportunity to try to make these conversations uh, more consistent, more structured, particularly when it comes to cost. Um, you know, uh, and I, I think that there's um, a variety of reasons, uh, you know, a real hesitation to bring it up at the point of the clinical encounter. Uh, that, you know, when and it's, it's a matter of intentionality. Uh, in my clinic, because I take care of women exclusively, uh, you know, I screen every patient that walks in my door for domestic violence. Um, and uh, I pick up on most cases of domestic violence just by asking people if they feel safe at home. Uh, and I'm not an expert in managing domestic violence, but if I find someone who's at risk, I have an idea or a framework in my mind of what to do next. I can suggest social work uh, or the police or shelter or whatever, whatever needs uh, to be done. Uh, for financial harm, I have no such model. Like, I have no question that I ask. My detection rate for people who are exposed to financial harm is probably close to 0%. Uh, and even if I do find somebody, I don't have a framework for what to do next. Um, and I think that's sort of what we need. And Neil, is so to carry on that last point, is that something that cost of care is, is taking on as their agenda to um, provide sort of a framework for providers to close that gap in communication and provide certain next steps um, in, in helping the consumer patients as they um, uh, seek care? It is. Um, that's absolutely Doc, our agenda. It, it's very clear to be the mind. doctor. Yeah, I mean, it, it's very clear to me that, that this is what has to happen next, um, that uh, particularly as patients, we've actually had a, a pretty big shift in where the American people are in thinking about this. It used to be a couple years ago that patients didn't want their doctors to bring up cost. Um, there is this broad perception that discussing dollars and cents uh, at the point of care would erode the doctor-patient relationship, that it would erode trust. Um, and now the opposite is true. The overwhelming majority, more than 90% of patients want cost to be part of the conversation, and actually the inability to talk about costs is what erodes the relationship and leads to distrust. Um, so there is demand for it. Um, there's a huge opportunity to just sync up the clinical workflow with the financial workflow in hospitals. You know, what patients experience is their blood being drawn. They don't experience that blood going to a laboratory, being run through 10 different tests that all become line items on a bill. Um, and so there, there's all this uh, asynchrony that uh, it seems to me, um, you know, with, with some intentionality and thoughtfulness, we could try to make better. Um, and you know, Neil, uh, both uh, you and uh, Benny uh, uh, talked about the importance of uh, collecting stories and uh, getting those stories about issues like the affordability and cost of care to uh, policymakers who are in Washington working on this issue. And I think the cost of care recently collected a lot of those stories. So what makes uh, the story collection process work well, and why is it important in your mind? Uh, Vivek Murthy, the former Surgeon General, um, was a um, you know, contemporary of mine when I was training. When he, he was just like an instructor in medicine. <laughs> at Brigham Women's Hospital, and he told me over coffee one day that a good story is worth a thousand academic papers in terms of changing behavior. Um, so that kind of stuck with me, and then we were being sent stories anyway. So when I started Costs of Care, I didn't really have a lot of ambition. It was just a website and a manifesto, um, but people kept on sending us stories of times that they got burned um, by uh, surprise medical bills, and uh, we decided that we would try to collect them. and. Um, just illustrate with case examples what people were encountering at the front lines of care, not just um, physicians and nurses, but patients as well. Um, and I think what the stories did is they, uh, they, they were heart-wrenching, but they also illustrated both the challenges and the opportunities with lots of specificity. 
um, at, at a level of granularity that just doesn't percolate into the public discourse otherwise. Um, we had uh, doctors in particular admitting to times that they made decisions that led to bad outcomes for patients financially. And getting doctors to admit to making mistakes on the record was very difficult, but we got them to send these stories and uh, it ended up being uh, really highly valued by journalists. So these stories ended up in every major media outlet. Um, and then, uh, Robert, as you pointed out, uh, recently we had reason to redeploy them, uh, even weaponize them, to be honest, um, because we had lots of patients. So we, we started collecting these back in 2010, uh, before the Affordable Care Act. Um, and we had lots of stories from back then of what uh, healthcare looked like without adequate coverage. Um, so um, we put out a press release a few weeks ago um, in the setting of the Senate bill, uh, and we um, announced that we would be releasing a new real patient story of what healthcare looked like before the ACA every day, and we would start doing it hourly um, as soon as uh, you know a vote date was announced. Um, and that never came to bear, but we uh, had that you know that was another recent use of those stories. Um, Neil, what is the role and obligation of the health system board in all of this? The, the data that you began with are, are very compelling. They're very upsetting. And the hospital is a venue for a lot of ways to ameliorate the situation. Not all of them, but a number of them. But what I'm wondering is, what is the role of the hospital board uh, and the health system board do you talk to them? Have, have you some ideas about how we make an impact uh, in terms of their responsibility to govern and the fact that the United States is doing so poorly and the outcomes of, of maternity? That's a great, great, great question. Um, so with maternal health care uh, specifically, I, I, I have uh, some thoughts about the role of the board for sure. Because I think that um, you know, as a service line of the hospital, childbirth is not the priority. It's a low margin service. So, you know, it has all of the cost of the cardiac ICU without the reimbursement. Uh, and I think for that reason, it gets deprioritized. And I think um, often, um, you know, at least traditionally, I've heard an anecdotally that, you know, when uh, the CFO reports to the board about financial performance, they'll show the fully big numbers and they'll show a version without psychiatry and childbirth. Um, and, I, you know, I, I think we're moving to a world, uh, especially where um, population health management is becoming part of the purview of large delivery systems where um, childbirth may have more primacy because people are starting to see their labor and delivery unit as the front door of the hospital. It's the first hospitalization in most people's lives. <laughs> it's their, um, you know, it's often what builds loyalty with the system. Um, moms end up being the primary healthcare decision makers for the entire family, um, and so there's strategic reasons to care about childbirth um, uh, beyond the fact that it's the right thing to do. But I, I'm hoping that the strategic reasons in the current delivery environment open a window of opportunity for uh, board members to start asking for more consideration about, you know, what we could be doing. Um, particularly deploying the population health management tools that we're using for the Medicare population. Uh, there's a lot of, um, you know, hot spotting and risk stratification that we're doing at that end of the age spectrum that uh, would be equally valuable in our childbearing population. I mean, the over 90% of moms are low risk and healthy. They should be getting a different model of care than the sickest patients. If you're on the board of a delivery system that has community hospitals and tertiary centers, uh, thinking about uh, the best ways to coordinate care to make sure you're delivering care in the community that's appropriate uh, in childbirth. All that stuff would make a tremendous difference. That would be my dream. So I think we have about time for, uh, enough time for one more question. Um, I'll leave it open, and if not, I'll take it. <laughs> So, Dr. Shaw, this is Brian McWilliams. Uh, I'm a project manager at a hospital here in uh, Pittsburgh. Um, the conversation about the proposed healthcare legislation has obviously been pretty forefront in the political zeitgeist and and, and all of us who think about healthcare a lot. Um, but all I keep hearing myself and anyone who's concerned about this to do is call your senators, call your uh, congressmen and tell them you don't like this bill. 
I just refuse to believe that that's the most that the average consumer and the average activist and the average healthcare professional can do to affect this system. I mean, it's something that we need to do given the situation that we're in. I mean, that might not be everyone's opinion, but um, do you have any advice for us as boots on the ground, things that we can do ourselves and things that we can be telling family, friends, coworkers that, that both live in this world of healthcare and just know that it's an issue that, that is on the table today? That's a good question, Brian. I think that the reason why people uh, framed things that way is because the pro it was, I think, largely because of the process. You know, this was a bill that uh, beyond the content, I think people felt was very rushed and it created a sense of acuity where, um, honestly, probably the most impactful thing for a few weeks that you could do was call your senators and, and pressure them. And in the end, I think that did make all the difference. Um, was, uh, you know, particularly in the Senate, hearing from constituents. Um, that being said, there's many forms of civic participation. And I think that, uh, you know, healthcare is one of those things where it's a fifth of the economy. So no matter who you talk to um, and how they're positioned to affect change, uh, it is something that they have to attend to. Um, you know, when I think about my own work, some of the biggest levers uh, that I have um, are, or the, the, the stakeholders with the most leverage are often the bulk purchasers of care. Like, you know, GE has its world headquarters in Boston, and I think a lot about the healthcare that they're purchasing and what that means for how I could work with them. Um, so I think, you know, no matter how you're, you're positioned, um, I, I think if you're somebody who's embedded in a healthcare delivery system that sees things, um, probably just you know, being able to relate what you're seeing with real granularity, real stories um, that back up your opinions, and then, you know, sharing them liberally with, um, you know, uh, uh, and it doesn't necessarily always have to be in politically charged language, doesn't even have to be specifically related to bills, thankfully, especially now, uh, uh, as of, uh, you know, this point in the week. <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, you know, I, 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 sh I, I guess what I'm saying is I'm agreeing with you that uh, there's more that we can do than just uh, calling our uh, representatives, but I think that the, the underlying premise of trying to communicate what we're seeing and particularly as forward deployed healthcare workers uh, communicating our opinions alongside our observations uh, is really powerful. Thank you. That was a really good question to end on, actually. Thank you, Brian. Um, so thank you, Neil, for all that you shared with us today. I hope everyone who tuned in today had most of their questions answered in this webinar. And uh, let's certainly keep this conversation going. Um, and we can use the Health Activist Network uh, forum space online to do so. Uh, before we go, I want to uh, do a quick plug for our next Health Activist Network event, which will be our speaker series event featuring Michael Millinson, who is the president of Health Quality Advisors. Um, this will take place Monday, September 18th from 5.30 to 7. Uh, Michael is an adjunct associate professor at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine and is most known for his work around making American healthcare better, safer, and more patient-centered. Uh, so please stay tuned for more information. Um, and finally, thank you everyone for tuning in and a special thanks to Neil for being on this call with us.